Hey everyone! Today I'd like to go over how the async and await keywords work in C Sharp. It all begins with a task. A task is a reference to some work that may not be done yet. Sometimes a task is a reference to CPU intensive work that's being done on another thread, but it can also be a reference to an IO operation, waiting for the file system or the network to return something. In those cases, you might think there's a thread spun up to wait for the IO operation to finish, but often that isn't the case. We'll talk more about that later. So a task simply refers to some operation that we expect will be completed in the future. By holding on to the task, we can check back in later to see when the work is done. A task can have a type parameter indicating what it will eventually return. Tasks are all you need to do asynchronous programming in C Sharp. But as things get more complicated, and you have multiple functions that spawn tasks, and tasks that depend on the results of other tasks, keeping track of everything becomes extremely difficult. This is where the async and await keywords come in. They allow you to write what looks like regular functions with a few await statements thrown in, and behind the scenes, the system splits your function into a list of code blocks that can be paused and resumed as the things being awaited finish. Let's see how this works. We'll start with a synchronous function that reads from the file system, and then make it async. This function reads from the file system three times using file.readAllText. The first file contains the name of the second file, the second file contains the name of the third file, and the third file contains the information we want. The point of this rather contrived example is to create a situation where each file system call is dependent on the result of the previous one, so we can't just load all three files in parallel. First we'll call this method directly. We'll pretend that these file system calls take a few hundred milliseconds, so if we were to call this method from the main thread, it would cause our application to become unresponsive for a noticeable amount of time. You can see from the output that everything runs on the calling thread, which is the main thread. So let's say we want to stop this function from locking up our app while it's running. The simplest thing to do is to use the lambda syntax to create a function delegate so we can call the function later, and then pass that delegate to task.run. Task.run will spawn a new thread and run our delegate on that new thread. The function delegate is of type func string, meaning that it's a function that returns a string. And when we pass the delegate to task.run, it gives us a task of type string, meaning it's a task that will eventually return a string. The type system here is really helping us out. From the output, we can see that this function actually runs on a different thread. In our example, this is fine because console.writeLine can be called from any thread. But let's imagine we're making a WinForms or a WPF application, and we want to show something in the UI each time the file is read. You're only allowed to interact with the UI from the main thread, so this would throw an exception. It's also worth noting that this function totally monopolizes this thread while it waits for the files. In this tiny application, it doesn't really matter, and because it's not the main thread, it won't lock up our application. But if this was a web server handling thousands of requests per second, it would be ideal if we could free up threads waiting on the file system so they can go do other things. Async await can help us with all of this. We start by making a new function and marking it as async. This simply gives us access to the await keyword. An async function without awaits is just a synchronous function. We will call this function directly, not wrapping it in task.run like the previous example. We then replace all the calls to the synchronous file.readAllText with file.readAllTextAsync. File.readAllTextAsync returns a task of type string, meaning at some point in the future, this operation will give us a string. But at this point, we don't have the string yet, and because we're actually still on the main thread, we don't want to just sit around waiting for it. We want to pause this whole function and come back to it later. The await keyword allows us to do just that. When we hit the first await, the function immediately returns. The system knows that eventually this function will return a string, but when we hit the first await statement, we don't have that string yet, so the system creates a task of type string and returns it to the caller. This is part of the magic of async await. We never explicitly create a task, but when we hit the first await statement, the system bundles up the rest of our function to run later and returns a task to the caller to let it know that the system will eventually run the rest of the function and return a string. It's important to remember that all the code in an async function before the first await statement will run synchronously with the caller. The asynchrony doesn't start until the first await statement. So when we await the task from file.readAllTextAsync, how does the system know when to come back and start running the rest of our function? 
You might think it spawns a new thread to sit and wait until the file is loaded, but this isn't the case. It actually sets up an OS callback to call back into our program to let us know when the file is ready. So we're actually only using the main thread for this entire async operation. If we used the synchronous file.readAllText and explicitly spawned a new thread using task.run, then we would get a new thread. This works, but again it monopolizes an extra thread just to wait for the file. Once the task from file.readAllTextAsync is completed, the system returns to our function. The await keyword automatically unwraps the task for us and assigns the resulting string to this variable. Now we're free to write some more regular code to add a file extension and print the result. If we look at the output of the print, we'll see that we're actually on the main thread. So if we wanted to write something to the UI or do anything else that requires being on the main thread, we could. Instead of saying we're on the main thread, it would be more accurate to say we're in the main synchronization context, but that is outside the scope of this video. This behavior of returning to the calling thread is really useful, but what if we don't care what thread the rest of our code runs on? Then we can call configure await false on the file task. This lets the system know that it can resume our function on any thread. In some situations, this may improve performance and avoid deadlocks if the calling thread is busy. Now that we have the second file name, we can call file.readAllTextAsync again and await the result. Again, the system will pause our function and wait for the OS to let us know when the file is ready. With the third file name, again we run some code and await the final task. Finally, we have the result string, which we return like normal. The system will now notify any code that is waiting on the task we returned back at the first await. In a real application, it's likely that our async function would be part of a large hierarchy of other async functions. So when our function finishes, it would notify other async functions that are waiting on the task we returned. At some point, something has to synchronously wait for these async operations to complete. Sometimes the framework you're using will handle this, meaning that all the code you write is asynchronous. In this simple example, I call our async function twice with different starting file names, and then manually wait for both of them to finish. They may not actually run in parallel because they're both hitting the file system, but if one of them was making network calls, then while one function is waiting to hear back from the network, the main thread could jump over to the other function, do some computations, request a file from the file system, and then come back once the original network call is finished. The main purpose of async await is coordinating all of that work and allowing you to describe the operations as though they were normal synchronous functions. Understanding what's actually going on can be quite difficult though because, as you might suspect, the system is doing a ton of stuff behind the scenes. For each async function, it actually generates a custom class with member variables for all the data the function uses. All of your code between the await statements gets bundled into a large switch statement with a case for each step between the awaits. The system runs the first case of the switch statement, fires off the first task you await, and when that task comes back, it comes back to the switch statement and runs the next case. While this is happening, all the data is stored in an instance of the custom class. This continues until all the code has been run. This entire operation, and the data it returns, are encapsulated in the task that is automatically created and returned when you hit the first await statement. If you'd like to see this generated class, you can inspect the compiled code using a tool like JetBrains.peak. This example project and the system-generated class code are available on GitHub and will be linked in the description. It's interesting to note that the async keyword isn't really a part of the function signature. For example, when you're defining an interface, you can't specify that you want an async function. As far as the rest of the program is concerned, all it cares about is that your function somehow returns a task. The task might be auto-generated by async await, but the code calling your function doesn't need to know that. In the end, async await is most useful as a tool to improve your code structure and make it more readable. Everything async await does can be recreated using tasks and other language features, but the result is likely to be much more complicated and hard to follow. In some cases, async await can offer performance benefits, but unless you're running into specific issues, like using too many threads waiting on I.O. operations, you're unlikely to see major improvements. Async await actually has a slight performance cost because of the generated classes and objects. I hope this video has shed some light on how and when async await can help improve your programming experience. If you found this video helpful, consider giving it a like. Thanks for watching.